Hey, welcome back to the channel, everybody. And in this week's video, I thought we would talk about VTP, the VLAN trunking protocol. Now, I know if you look through the exam blueprints for the new CCNA exam, that's exam number 200-301, or the new Encore exam, that's exam number 350-401, You'll find no evidence of VTP on those exam blueprints. However, I still want you to know it. And what VTP does in general is it lets us go to one switch in our topology, add a VLAN, change a VLAN, delete a VLAN, and that change is then propagated throughout other switches in our topology. That can be a great time saver, but there's also a lurking danger. And in this video, we'll talk about that danger and how to avoid a catastrophe that could happen to our VLAN databases. And by the way, do me a favor, if you like this video, click the like button down below. It really helps the channel. And also subscribe so you don't miss any of our weekly content. Now, let's dive into a discussion of VTP. In this video, let's talk about VTP. Now, technically, VTP is not on the Encore Blueprint, but I still think it's very important that you know this. It might pop up in your real-world scenarios. VTP stands for VLAN Trunking Protocol. However, some other Cisco literature says it stands for VLAN Trunk Protocol, so you can use those interchangeably. But personally, I'm not a big fan of the name because VTP is not a trunking protocol. The reason that trunk is in the name of VTP is that this is a protocol that runs over trunks. Here we have all of our switches interconnected with trunks. And the purpose in life of VTP is to allow us to create, modify, or delete a VLAN on one switch and have that change propagated throughout our switched infrastructure so we don't have to make changes on each switch individually. For example, here on switch SW1, maybe I create VLAN 100. Well, if we have VTP configured, that switch SW1 can send VTP advertisements over its trunk links down to switches SW2 and SW3. And they're going to update their VLAN database and they're going to create VLAN 100. Then they're going to forward the VTP advertisements down to switches SW4 and SW5. And then they have VLAN 100 created in their VLAN database. And that's the quick overview of what VTP is going to be doing for us. But let's get a bit more detailed. A switch running VTP can operate in different VTP modes. Let's talk about these different modes. The first mode is server mode. Here, we're able to create a VLAN on a switch configured for server mode. We can delete, we can modify VLANs. But just because we're a server doesn't mean that we cannot learn from someone else. If we receive a VTP advertisement from another switch, yeah, we might update our VLAN database based on that advertisement. That begs the question, how do I know that that advertisement I just received is more authoritative than my own VLAN database? Well, we're going to have something called a configuration revision number. And whoever has the highest configuration revision number is going to be considered the most authoritative source of VLAN information. So if I receive a VTP advertisement and let's say its configuration revision number is 10, but my local VLAN database has a configuration revision number of 9, then I'm going to believe the advertisement. And a server mode switch can forward VTP advertisements that it receives. And if we make a change directly on that switch configured as a server, then it can originate VTP advertisements. Contrast server mode with client mode. With client mode, we cannot go to the command line interface of that switch and say, I want to create or modify or delete a VLAN. However, that switch does have a VLAN database and we can update that VLAN database based on advertisements that we receive. And if we receive an advertisement, then we're going to forward that advertisement out our trunk ports and we can originate VTP advertisements. How is that possible? If I'm not able to make a change, how can I originate a VTP advertisement? This is a common point of confusion. In fact, some people have put their switches in client mode to make it quote unquote safe to add them to an existing network. And it's led to some disastrous results. We'll talk about that coming up in just a few moments. But client mode, we cannot go directly to that switch and create, modify, or delete a VLAN. And maybe we have a switch that doesn't really want to participate in uh, this exchange of VTP advertisements. We can have a switch in transparent mode. Here we can go to the command line interface on that switch and we can create, delete, modify VLANs. But if we receive a VTP advertisement, we don't make any updates based on that. 
We don't originate any VTP advertisements. We don't tell anybody what we have configured on our switch, and we don't update our switch based on information we receive from anyone else. However, if I receive an advertisement from a neighboring switch, I'm not going to stop it because somebody downstream from me may want that information. So we still can forward VTP messages that we receive. And we have different versions of VTP that we'll be talking about in a few moments. But in version 3, there's support for something called a primary server. So instead of just a server mode, we can have a primary server. This is only something available in VTP version 3, and it is the only switch in our topology that can create, delete, or modify VLANs. This can help overcome that danger that I was telling you about that we'll discuss in a moment. Specifically, it can prevent the accidental overriding of a VLAN database. Now let's take a look at an example using some of these different VTP modes. Let's say that switch SW1 is running in server mode. SW2 is in client mode. SW3 is a transparent mode switch. SW4 is in server mode. SW5 is client mode. And let's say I go to switch SW1 and I create VLAN 100. Well, we're going to send VTP advertisements down to switches SW2 and SW3 over those trunk links. And SW2, which is in client mode, it's going to update its VLAN database and it's going to create VLAN 100 on its switch. But switch SW3 is in transparent mode. It's not going to update its VLAN database. But it's not going to stop the advertisement. Both switches SW2 and SW3, they will forward on that VTP advertisement over their trunk links down to switches SW4 and SW5. And one is in server mode and one is in client mode. And they both create VLAN 100 in their VLAN database. So we can have multiple servers in a network, unless we're running VTP version 3 where we have a primary server. Now let's talk a bit more about that caution where we might accidentally overwrite the VLAN database on all of our switches. Here, I'm showing you the configuration revision number of all the switches in this topology. And everybody should agree, once we reach a steady state and everybody agrees on what the VLAN database looks like, every switch, except a transparent mode switch, every switch is going to agree on the VLAN database and they're going to agree on the configuration revision number. That way, if I go to a switch like SW1 and I create a new VLAN, that will increment the configuration revision number from, in this case, 12, to 13. And when that advertisement goes out to switches SW2, SW4, and SW5, they're going to say, oh, 13. That's more authoritative than my configuration revision number of 12. So I'm going to update my VLAN database based on that. Now notice a transparent mode switch has a configuration revision number of a zero. Now here's the danger I was telling you about. Imagine this scenario. Imagine this is my company's production network and we just got a brand new switch in. And I've been playing with the switch, trying out some new quality of service features perhaps. And I've been adding, deleting, modifying VLANs. And now it's time to put this switch into production. And we'll say that this is going to be switch SW6. And I don't want to cause a disruption to the existing VLAN database. So I think I'll switch this to client mode. But notice that this switch, which has just been sitting on my desk, based on all the changes I've made, it's got a configuration revision number of 25. Is that a problem? It sure is. As soon as I plug this into the topology, then it's going to send out its VTP advertisement, assuming that's a trunk connection between SW6 and SW4, and it is going to blow away the existing VLAN databases on our switches, except for the transparent mode switch. And those switches are now going to have configuration revision number 25. They're going to have the uh, VLAN database that I configured on my desk, which does not mirror what's going on in the corporate network at all. This is a big danger. So how do we avoid falling into that trap? Well, it's not enough just to have a switch in client mode because that does not reset the configuration revision number. It's not even enough to delete your VLAN database. There's a file in the flash of your switch called vlan.dat. Even if you delete that, that doesn't get rid of your configuration revision number. Here's what I normally do. Before adding a switch to a network like this, I would do two things. I would first set the mode to transparent. And by doing that, that's how we set the configuration revision number to a zero. 
then I would delete that VLAN database just as an extra caution. It's probably not necessary, but I like to do that just as an extra caution. And then maybe I set it to client mode. Now when I plug into the network, I'm not going to have the authoritative configuration revision number because I reset it to a zero by switching it temporarily to transparent mode. And we also mentioned a moment ago that if we're running VTP version 3, that could protect us against this as well. Because with VTP version 3, we can have a primary server. We can have just one switch that's able to create, modify, or delete VLANs. So the addition of this extra switch in the network is not going to inadvertently uh, destroy our existing VLAN databases. In fact, let's talk about some of the different version enhancements. What we've been talking about so far is generally true for VTP version 1, but what extra things do we get with VTP versions 2 and 3? First, let's consider VTP version 2. The first one isn't that impressive these days. It supports token ring VLANs. Well, I haven't had to work with a token ring VLAN since I think back in 2001 when I took my CCA lab way back then. There was token ring on the lab. Yeah, you're probably not going to be running into that much in today's networks. But with VTP version 2, a transparent mode switch, if it receives an advertisement, it's not going to check to see if that advertisement matches its VTP domain configuration or its version information. It's just going to forward it on. Now with VTP version 3, we mentioned that it supports that primary server where we have that one switch on which we can create, delete, or modify VLANs. And that's going to prevent somebody from adding a switch intentionally or accidentally that could have a higher configuration revision number and delete everything on all the switches. We want to prevent that. Also, something we could not do with VTP versions 1 and 2, we could not support extended VLANs in the range of 1006 through 4094. We can with VTP version 3. It also supports private VLANs. It supports multiple spanning tree. It improves authentication. You can even turn it off with version 3. You can turn the mode to off. And the great news is, since there's so much VTP version 2 out there today, VTP version 3 is backwards compatible with both versions 1 and version 2. Now that we've taken a look at the theory of VTP, let's check out the configuration. In this example, let's say that using this topology, we want switches SW1 and SW2 to be in server mode. Switch SW3, we want it to be in client mode. So let's go into switch SW1, and in global configuration mode, I'm going to say VTP mode, and here we see our context sensitive help. And I'm going to set the mode to server. And it probably already is a server by default, but let's see. Yeah, it says the device is already a VTP server. Now let's set the VTP domain. And the domain needs to match among all the switches that are going to be exchanging VTP information. And I'll say VTP domain, and we'll call this Encore. Let's press enter. And it looks like I've already set the domain to Encore. And for security purposes, let's set a password. That way somebody's not going to add a switch into our topology and maybe accidentally or intentionally override our switches VLAN databases because they would have to have a matching password. And to set the password, I'm going to say VTP password. And I'll give a password of capital S three C R E T. Not terribly secure, but easy to remember for a lab environment. So I've sort of spelled that secret there and that's going to be our password. And I also want to turn on VTP pruning. I'll say VTP pruning. And let's talk about what that means. If you think about a trunk, by default, it carries traffic for all VLANs. And if a switch is trying to forward a frame to the appropriate destination, if it doesn't know that destination, then it's going to flood that frame out of all other ports other than the port the frame came in on, including flooding it over trunks. And that means that broadcast, multicast, unknown unicast traffic for a VLAN, it's going to flow over all of our trunks. Well, what if a destination switch on the other end of my trunk doesn't have a member of VLAN 100, let's say? Do I really want to send VLAN 100 broadcast, multicast, and unknown unicast traffic over to that other switch? Probably not. That's going to be sort of a waste because there's nobody that's a member of VLAN 100 in this example on that far end switch. So by turning on VTP pruning, uh, we can intelligently say, I'm only going to be sending uh, this broadcast, multicast, and unknown unicast traffic over a trunk if the receiving switch has a member of this VLAN. 
So we're gonna turn on VTP pruning and I'm gonna set VTP version two on this switch. That's really commonly used in today's networks even though version three is available. And let's end. Let's take a look at our configuration. I'll say show VTP status. And notice that this switch is capable of running versions one, two, or three, but currently we're running version two. The domain name is Encore, pruning is enabled. And we see that we're in server mode and our configuration revision number is 14. Remember, when everybody in the topology is in a steady state, everybody's configuration revision number should match. And we see the MD5 hash of my password. And let's go over to switch SW2 and give nearly an identical configuration. We'll go into global configuration mode and I'll say the VTP mode is server. The VTP domain is Encore. The VTP password is capital S three C R E T. We want to enable VTP pruning and let's have a matching version of version two. And let's look at our status. I'll say show VTP status. Now, by the way, I've already set up trunking between all of our switches. So VTP advertisements can flow over these links. And we see that we have what appears to be a matching configuration revision number. We've got a 14 here. If I go look at switch SW1, it was also 14. So we should agree on what our VLAN database is. Let's see, I've got VLANs that I've added of engineering and sales. What about switch SW2? If I do a show VLAN brief, do I have a matching set of VLANs? I sure do. And finally, let's go configure switch SW3 with one slight difference. Let's set this to client mode. In global configuration, I'll say VTP mode client. And I was already set to client mode on this switch from a previous demonstration. I'll say my VTP domain is Encore. I need to have a matching VTP password. Let's turn on pruning. And when I try to set the version, notice what happens. If I say VTP version two, it says, nope, you're not allowed to do that because you're in client mode unless we're running VTP version three and we're not. Let's end. Oh, and it's further evidence that we're in client mode. Check this out. If I try to create a VLAN, if I say VLAN, let's say 500, is it gonna work? Nope, says you're not allowed to do that because we're in client mode. Have I learned VLANs though? If I do a show VLAN brief, I know about the sales and engineering VLANs. Now let's create a new VLAN on switch SW1 and make sure that it's learned on switches SW2 and SW3. So let's go back to one of our server switches. Again, we can have more than one server switch. And on switch SW1, I'm gonna say, let's create VLAN 300. And I'll give it a name of VTP underscore test. Let's end that. Make sure we've added it to our VLAN database. I'll do a show VLAN brief command. There it is. We've got a VTP test VLAN. And the next question is, did this new VLAN get propagated by VTP down to switches SW2 and SW3? Let's find out. Let's go down to switch SW2 and we'll say show VLAN brief. Does it have VLAN 300? It does right there. What about switch SW3 that was in client mode? If I do a show VLAN brief? Yes, it has also learned about this new VLAN. Let's take a look at the VTP status on SW3. We'll do a show VTP status command. And let's check out the configuration revision number. It's 15. Does that match switch SW2? Let's do a show VTP status. Yes, it does. What about SW1? Show VTP status. Is it 15? It is. So now we're in a steady state environment. Everybody in the topology, everybody in this VTP domain specifically, agrees on what the VLAN database should look like. And that's a look at how we configure VTP.